Hi everyone, my name is Trevor Hedberg and I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of South Florida. This, as you can probably gather from the title, is a PowerPoint presentation about moral psychology and prejudice as portrayed in Disney's Utopia. So first let me say a little bit about the background for this PowerPoint presentation. The date on this article on the slide is March 13, 2017, but the idea actually goes back quite a bit further than that, um, probably June of 2016. At that time, I was getting ready to start my last year of graduate studies at the University of Tennessee. I was working toward a PhD in philosophy, and I was getting within striking distance of the end of the doctoral dissertation. But that summer, I was also giving some thought to what I'd be teaching over the next year, and the main course that was on the docket for me was Contemporary Moral Problems. This is a standard applied ethics survey course. You'll get a little bit of introduction to moral theory, and then you know may spend the bulk of your time looking at applied issues like abortion, euthanasia, uh, the ethical treatment of animals, capital punishment, affirmative action, and really whatever other issues the instructor might want to include in such a course. And when I taught that course previously, I had included a section at the end of the term on psychological obstacles to acting ethically. So ways in which we know what the right thing to do is, but for whatever reason, we screw up. We, we don't succeed in doing what we know and believe would be the right thing to do. So that book li listed there in the bottom right, Blind Spots, Why We Fail to Do What's Right and What to Do About It, is a book that's largely about that same idea, the psychological dimensions of uh, how we behave that get in the way of doing the right thing. In June 2016, I saw Zootopia for the first time. Yeah, I know, I know. It had been out since March, but I never saw it in theaters. I, I had been burned too many times by subpar animated films that might have been enjoyable but were just utterly forgettable. And I didn't have high expectations for it. And to my uh, surprise, I was deeply mistaken. The film was incredibly rich, and my initial reaction to it was actually, well, what a great teaching tool this would be for some of my classes. And so as the semester, fall semester approached, I started to think, okay, what can I do to incorporate this into my class in an organic way? And the natural way to do it was to use it as an introduction to concepts surrounding bias and prejudice, because I believe that's what the film is centrally about. Now, my initial thought was, I don't really want to have to write up stuff on my own or prepare that much material. Somebody else must have had this idea, right? Somebody else must have compiled some resources. So I went, I went online, looked at a bunch of reviews, um, looked, looked for other materials, but I couldn't find anything that was suitable to use for what I wanted to use it for. And what was remarkable is I actually discovered that a lot of reviewers seemed to be interpreting the film rather poorly. Here's an example of one of the reviews that I think got Zootopia wrong. I completely agree with the film's message. Stereotypes are bad and hurt everyone. But since Zootopia really wants to promote a message, it should be held to higher structural and intellectual standards than most films. Unfortunately, under scrutiny, I think it fails. Now, if you come across one uncharitable review of a film or one misinterpretation, you can just chalk that up to chance. But what was interesting is, this wasn't the only kind of misinterpretation. And just to be clear, the misinterpretation I'm talking about is in what's identified as the film's message. If, the, if all the film wants to do is establish that stereotypes are bad and hurt everyone, then, well, it, it doesn't frankly have a whole lot of interest to say. Because that's not a particularly novel message. It's been done many times. What was interesting, though, is that this isn't the only misinterpretation. There are others. The most common misinterpretation seems to be that the film was just a racial allegory. That the film was, in other words, about how the predators were analogous to African Americans and 
the prey were analogous, I, I presumably, to white people. And for various reasons, this doesn't work. And I, I actually agree with these commentators that that doesn't work, but that's not what the film, I don't think that's what the film is about. And so when I started to think about how I would present this to my students, my initial thought was, well, I definitely don't want them to interpret the film this way. Uh, I want them to be able to understand what the film is really about and why we can learn something from it. Now in philosophy, we spend a lot of our time evaluating arguments, trying to assess whether arguments for controversial claims are good or bad. One of the main principles we use in argumentative assessment is known as the principle of charity. This is the, a principle according to which we try to reconstruct arguments as sensibly as we can given what the author said in their defense. Now, what that means in practice is we always try to engage with the strongest version of the argument possible. We don't waste our time trying to misrepresent the author's views or trying to score rhetorical points by making their view sound silly. We try to engage with the view that, sh that portrays the author in their best possible light. So you might be wondering what the relevance of that principle of charity has to the topic under discussion. Well, the relevance is, I think, a similar principle applies to works of art. That principle might be de defined as follows. When interpreting an artwork, interpret it in the way that makes the work as coherent and, as, and aesthetically excellent as possible, given the content and context of the work. What I think was going wrong with some of these reviewers is they weren't abiding by this kind of principle. Now look, I get it. it. It's fun to tear down bad movies. It's it's fun to make fun of the bad acting in the room and the incoherent script. Um, there's a certain guilty pleasure in watching, you know, YouTube reviews of films like Battlefield Earth or M. Night Shyamalan's The Last Airbender. I get it. And I think those are all, in various ways, quite bad movies. But there's also got to be another side to this, right? If, if that's all we did, if all we did was try to find every possible flaw in every work of art, we'd almost never find anything that we really liked or that we really thought was good or valuable. So sometimes, at least if we're trying to objectively assess how good a work of art is, we got to make some kind of an effort to be charitable to understand the work in a positive way. So now we come to my own view of the film. I think there's a way to understand Zootopia's content and its thematic message that shit puts it in a much better light than what some of these reviewers have suggested. I don't think that this is some simplistic kids movie that's just trying to show how prejudice is bad. And I also don't think that this is designed to be some sort of poorly executed racial allegory. Instead, I think the film is best interpreted as an illustration of how morally good people can act unethically through vulnerability to bias. In other words, I view this film really as more of a character study, an example of how people who are morally good can nonetheless fail to do the right thing because they are in various ways psychologically hardwired to act on biased impulses and attitudes. So at this point I have to give the obligatory spoiler warning. If you have somehow made it this far in this commentary without ever having seen Zootopia, please stop. You're not impressing anyone. Zootopia was one of the very best films of 2016, and it might be one of the best animated films in the last 20 or 25 years. Don't ruin it for yourself. Just go see the film, and then come back and pick up from here. Plus, since I'm going to be making a lot of references to the ending and the core plot details, features of the main characters, the, the, the movie's themes, etc., you're not going to be well positioned to understand what I'm talking about unless you have seen the film. So if you haven't seen it, 
hit the escape button, close a window, go find a copy of it, or really just outright buy it. It's, it's good enough. Trust me, it'd be worth your investment. Watch it and then come back. Are you still here? Great. Let's get on to business. Now, I want to start with an observation that isn't that obvious. Zootopia is not a plot-driven movie. On paper, when you find out that it's a buddy cop film that involves trying to solve a mystery and expose a government conspiracy, a conspiracy which is actually kind of complicated, it essentially involves a person in political power trying to systematically infect members of a minority population with a deadly virus that makes them go insane to instill fear in the public, which will enable her to keep her political power. That's pretty crazy in a way that that's in an animated animal movie, but, you know, whatever. And it's easy to get lost in all the details of that plot and, and its ensuing complications, and also the particular details that that involve Judy. I mean, there's also other stuff that happens that's um, that makes the plot even kind of crazier in certain ways, like Judy's running with a mob boss and the multiple times she almost dies. But at its core, all that stuff is kind of window dressing for what the film is really about. The film's about characters, particularly these two characters. On the right, we've got our protagonist, Judy Hopps. On the left, we've got the sly fox, Nick Wilde, who serves as her accomplice for the majority of the film. So who are these characters? Let's start with Judy. She could best be described as an idealist. She is someone who sees the world in its best possible light, someone who views Zootopia as a place where anyone can be anything, someone who has tremendous confidence in her own abilities, and someone who is just incredibly tenacious, or in other words, not willing to give up on her goals very easily. She is also very impulsive, which winds up being very important in numerous instances in the film. She tends to make decisions without fully thinking them through, often opting for kind of the, the immediate knee-jerk reaction to a situation rather than the cool, calm deliberation that in some cases might be more appropriate. Two instances where this is particularly important, one, when she chases after Duke Weaselton um, after he steals something from the local flower shop. Um, she doesn't give any thought to her assignment as a meter maid or her um, the ramifications of abandoning her post or, or potentially endangering other, other members of the city. She just chases after him and tries to catch him. She, she does succeed, but it's kind of a mixed bag as to whether or not that was really the right way to handle that situation. The other one is at the end of, this, of the uh, movie when they have encountered, when she and Nick have encountered Doug's secret drug lab. I mean, he is making the Night Howler virus there, but it is a spot-on reference for Breaking Bad. And uh, right down to, the, to the, the lab equipment and what Doug is wearing and, and every, everything else. So I'm just going to say it was a drug manufacturing lab. She makes a decision to basically hijack the lab. It's in a train car, and she basically just goes into the uh, the engineer's control the engineer's control room and just takes the the train. Um, and this almost winds up being very bad because they wind up going down a line where another train is coming, and there's almost a head-on collision. So that was a very dangerous decision, and Nick was constantly telling her not to do it. Right, carrots. I don't know what you're thinking, but whatever it is, stop thinking it. Right? But did she listen? No, no, she did not. The other thing I'll point out here is that Judy is willing to break the rules when she needs to. What this means, in effect, is she doesn't habitually follow her obligations as a police officer. The most obvious one here is when she and Nick are investigating a limo in Tundra Town. She has no warrant that justifies going in, and she essentially just kind of goes in anyway. Uh, there's a little more to it, but 
her 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 rationale for doing so is super shoddy and would not hold up in a court of law. So what about Nick? Well, Nick's pretty much Judy's opposite in almost every way. Whereas she is idealistic and sees the best in other people and the best in Zootopia, he is much more pessimistic, much more cynical, very skeptical of other people's abilities and intentions. He's also very cautious, which is interesting. He's much larger physically than Judy is. But if you notice, he's always the one who is more prone to run away rather than confront a problem directly. When he first encounters Judy, that's actually what he tries to do. He just basically distracts her for a brief moment by pointing off to the side. And in the two seconds that she looks away, he's already tried to slip around the corner and out of sight. There are plenty of other instances where he seems, I, I wouldn't say cowardly, because his, his, uh, his caution is almost always justified. They are almost always, he's almost always in dangerous situations, like when he's in front of Mr. Big and surrounded by these giant polar bears and knows he could be killed at any time. Reasonable to be cautious in that situation. Reasonable to be somewhat scared or worried about your predicament. But it's clear way in which he is not like Judy at all. And the other thing is, he deliberates about what to do much more thoughtfully than Judy does in a couple of key moments in the film. One of the major moments where this happens is when they are about to hijack the train car. Nick makes a reference to just taking the gun with the Night Howler serum in it. And that would be enough. Just take the gun, slip away, and Judy insists that they take all of the evidence in the entire train car, which is why she hijacks it. Appropriately, near the end of the film, when the train car derails and explodes, and it seems like all the evidence was destroyed, Nick had the presence of mind to grab the briefcase, the critical piece of evidence that was used to expose the whole thing at the end. If he doesn't do that, this story ends very differently. This other item that I have on here that he never lets others see that they get to him, uh, he puts on a very, you know, strong fa strong facade, but it is a facade. There, is, there are a few moments in the film where he shows vulnerability, uh, shows that he actually does have various fears and insecurities about himself, but for the most part, his public persona does not expose those to others. Now let's focus on a few pivotal differences that that are important to understanding how the characters interact. First, Judy does not think that your species membership determines your life path. She thinks anybody can be anything. So it doesn't matter how tall you are, doesn't matter what your gender is, doesn't matter what species you are, uh, doesn't, doesn't matter how intelligent you are. If you are willing to pursue something with a dogged determination, you can do whatever that thing is, at least in the context of Zootopia. That may sound, to some of us, hopelessly naive, and that is more or less what she concludes in a way at the end of the film, but that's what she believes for most of the movie. Nick believes almost the exact opposite. He believes that you can only be what you are. You can only do what the world allows you to do. So in his case, he wanted to be a junior ranger scout, but he was a fox, and the other scouts did not trust him just because he was a fox. It didn't matter what he did. It didn't matter how he treated them. It didn't matter how loyal or caring he was. Just the fact he was a fox essentially in their eyes disqualified him from being a part of this group. And that molded a lot of his perception of the world, because in his view, if everybody is just going to treat me as if I am an untrustworthy and deceptive fox, what's the point of trying to change and trying to be better than that? It just seems like it's a waste of time. If I'm not going to be treated any better, I, I might as well just conform to their expectations and try to live my life as best I can under those circumstances. 
Another pivotal difference between the two is Judy, for most of the film, operates under this idealistic assumption that people are not really biased. And, and, and that includes her, right? She includes herself in that category. Nick, in contrast, because of his experiences and his understanding of the world, he is all too aware of bias in himself, in others, and to an extent in Judy. Um, he, he has a line of dialogue after the press conference where he more or less um, more or less suggests that he's been aware of her biased attitudes from the very beginning of the movie, from their very first interaction. One of the other pivotal differences is that both of them encounter skeptics about their character and abilities. Judy's skeptics do not believe she can be a real cop. They do not believe that a bunny can make it as a police officer. Nick encountered skeptics who did not believe that he could be essentially a morally good person because he was a fox. Judy's response to her skeptics is to basically double down on her ambition and to just try that much harder to prove them wrong. Nick's w reaction was the opposite. He responded to his skeptics by essentially conforming to their expectations, basically shrugging his shoulders and saying, well, what is the point of trying to be better if no one's going to, you know, if no one's going to treat me any better? So with all of the character traits established as background, we can now start to look at the thematic content of the film and how the plot unfolds. The first thing I want to highlight is that the film is clearly not about prejudice just being bad. That, that is not the main message of the film. And the reason why I don't think this is a plausible interpretation is because we get that message in the film's prologue about nine minutes into the movie. So this screenshot is from the, the scene at the train station where Judy's getting ready to leave to become, to, to start her position as an officer at, at the ZPD. At that point, she has a conversation with her parents where they express, let's say, unfavorable attitudes toward predator species especially foxes, and her father even tries to get her to take fox away, fox repellent, and a fox taser with her. Judy points out in this conversation that her parents are reasoning very poorly. So she, she points out, for instance, that she has met plenty of bunnies who have been jerks in her time, and she doesn't conclude from that that all bunnies are jerks. Similarly, why are her parents drawing that same conclusion about foxes from their interactions with Gideon Gray in the past? She says, you know, Gideon Gray was a jerk who was a fox, but that was just a coincidence. That does not imply that all foxes are jerks. Her parents don't really get that message. They don't really take this on board, but we in the audience do take it on board and we understand what she's talking about. The reason this is important to recognize is that if the film is basically telling us prejudice and stereotyping are bad, if it's telling us that nine minutes into the movie, that's not the central message of the movie, right? If that was the central message of the movie, we wouldn't be getting this kind of observation until sometime in the epilogue of the film, right? We would be getting it after Judy's perspective in some way had been changed by personal experiences. But her perspective doesn't need to be changed. She's already anti-prejudice. She's already anti-stereotyping. That's not what the film is really about. Second thing I want to highlight is Zootopia's most iconic scene. Now, when I say the most iconic scene, you're probably going to think of you know, the, the reunion scene with Nick at, uh, under the bridge, or the train chase scene at the end, or the, the confrontation with Bellwether in the Natural History Museum, or, or maybe the, uh, the chase in Little Rodentia involving um, Judy and, and, and Duke Weaselton. Those are all good scenes. None of them are the iconic scene of the movie, though. In fact, the iconic scene of the movie is so 
short and so simple that you may not even remember it clearly. Here's the scene. Judy wakes up for her first day on the job, turns off the alarm clock, goes to her night, puts on her uniform, goes to the nightstand, thinks about taking the fox repellent off the nightstand, shrugs her shoulders, decides not to, walks out the door. Three seconds later, the door reopens, she puts her hand or paw in, grabs the fox repellent off the, uh, off the nightstand, shuts the door, and then we cut to the ZPD where she's walking in for her first day on the force. That 15 second clip is the most important part of the entire movie. You probably don't believe me on that. Or at least, if I were in your position, I would be skeptical. But don't worry, I've got an argument for it. Here's the basic reason why this is the most iconic scene in the movie. It contains the core essence of the central theme. That may not be obvious, but that's the reason. I'm going to explain why it contains the core essence of the movie's central theme. But to do that, we've got to take a bit of a detour. So now we're going to talk about the human brain and how it works. Is that what you expected to see on the next slide in this Zootopia PowerPoint? Probably not. Is it going to make sense? Yes, it will make sense. I know, I know you're freaking out right now, but look. You're 26 minutes into this thing at this point, and as far as I'm concerned, you're in it for the long haul. Are you really going to stop now? I hope not. It's going to make sense. Just have a little faith. If you've been following anything in contemporary psychology in the last 20 years, you've probably heard of a guy named Daniel Kahneman. He published a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which summarized a bunch of research of his on the human brain and how it works. The main critical thing that we need to note from this research is that the brain has two different systems. They have come to be known by the incredibly uncreative labels of System 1 and System 2. But if that's too boring for you, think of it as a difference between your unconscious thought processes and your conscious thought processes. System 1 is the unconscious side. System 1 regulates everything that is not within the realm of our conscious perception. It tends to be associated with quick, automatic responses, reflexes, emotional reactions, in and instincts. It is basically effortless. It requires almost nothing, no serious demands on our part for it to do its job. System 2, as you might imagine, is pretty much the opposite. System 2 is very taxing and requires a lot of energy. It is also the only kind of thinking we really do that feels deliberate and calculated and involves a process of reasoning. It also tends to be much slower than System 1. System 1 reactions happen in the blink of an eye. System 2, well tends to involve a little more work and a little more time on our parts. These two systems are not independent of one another. They work in tandem to help us make our way through the world. Here's an example of an interesting interaction between the two that some of you may have experienced. If you've ever driven somewhere and you've gotten distracted by, say, a lingering thought or something that you remember from the previous day, maybe a conversation you have with a work colleague or friend or some errand you remember you have to run later, you've probably had the experience of being conscious of your driving and where you're going and then just kind of spacing out for a while and then being at your destination as if by magic. This can be a very disorienting experience given how dangerous driving can be. And you may be wondering, what the hell happened? How did I get here? 
if you don't drive a whole lot, you may have had the same experience walking somewhere that you walk to regularly, right? So maybe you have a local restaurant that you walk to from your apartment, or you live on a college campus and you have a routine that you go through every day, walking to the library or walking to classes. The same thing can happen in that context. What's going on in these kinds of cases is you start out with system two being in control of your driving or your walking or whatever. And what happens is at some point, system two wants to devote its resources, which again, they're very limited because system two thinking is very demanding. System two wants to devote its resources to doing something else. And so essentially system two says to system one, hey, uh, I want to think about something else. Can, can you handle this? I mean, this is a place we've gone to like a million times. And system one says, all right, bro, I got you back. Yeah, that's how system one talks, whatever. And system two then starts thinking about the other stuff. And then when you arrive at your destination, system one says, hey, man, I did my job. Like, you got to take over again. And that's when you become aware of where you are. Now, putting aside the fact that System 1 and System 2 may not communicate in quite the same way I've portrayed, that is the basic idea. The systems are interacting with one another, and what's disorienting is that you have this shift from System 2 awareness of your driving or your walking or whatever, and then it disappears, and then you pop back, and it's as if you got to your destination by magic. You didn't get there by magic. You got there because System 1 has automated that process. It is familiar enough with the pattern of driving or the pattern of where you're walking to to do that. And that's really cool. But there are problems. Even though System 1 is really useful because it governs so much of what we do, there are times where System 1 gets us into trouble. Because System 2 is so limited and can only handle so many ta tasks at once, we sometimes wind up making judgments that are grounded in System 1 responses that aren't the best judgments. Moreover, when System 2 is hindered, say by fatigue or stress or being drunk, we tend to use System 1 to make more decisions. So again, there's a, there's a situation that some of you may be familiar with where this happens. If you've ever heard the phrase that like, when people are drunk, the truth comes out. What, what's really going on there is ordinarily people filter what they say pretty carefully in ordinary conversations. You don't just say every single thing that comes to your mind. But when your system two processing is hindered, when you're really, really tired, or you're really, really stressed out, or you're drunk, you're not going to have the same kind of resources to do that filtering. And so when you're really irritated because you've had a bad day at work and you're really stressed out and something bothers you, you may just lash out in, in anger or irritation when ordinarily you would control yourself. But that control requires a certain degree of system to regulation. The same thing happens when people are drunk. The truth is not coming out quote unquote, what's happening is they're just not filtering what they say to the same degree that they normally would. So whatever like sort of just impulsive system one response they have is more likely to escape into verbal conversation than it would be otherwise. Okay, so with that detour out of the way and with that information about the brain on the table, we can come back to the fox repellent, that prominent little symbol from the iconic scene I mentioned earlier. Here are a couple of things to note about that fox repellent. First of all, Judy gets it about 10 minutes into the film from her parents, specifically her dad, and she never actually uses it at any point in the film. There are a couple of instances where she gestures at maybe using it, but she never actually does. Whenever you have an item that features prominently in various shots and circumstances, but is never actually used, that's a pretty safe bet that its main purpose in the film is symbolic. So, 
what might this be a symbol of? It's a symbol of Judy's bias. The fox repellent features prominently in several scenes where her bias is completely exposed. One of these is at the very beginning of the film where she trails Nick into the ice cream parlor. She's constantly kind of fiddling with her fox repellent, wondering if she's going to have to use it when she wanders in. Another one is right after the press conference when Nick confronts her. He even makes a remark that he has noticed the fox repellent from the moment that they first encountered one another. Like, Nick has noticed that Judy has these attitudes toward foxes from the very beginning, and that she's even taking precautions against um, the possibility of him going savage or otherwise ass assaulting her. So what exactly is going on in these scenes where Judy is engaging in this biased behavior? What's happening is a very consistent pattern in her reasoning that maps on to the System 1 and System 2 stuff we just talked about. Consciously, Judy endorses values tied to equality and rejects prejudicial attitudes and perspectives. Right. So when she's given an opportunity to deliberate about these things, she will always side with the Anything, anyone can be anything, you know, everyone should be treated as equals, those kinds of worldviews. But her implicit attitudes, represented symbolically by that fox repellent, they tell a very different story. They suggest that Judy doesn't really hold that worldview, or at least doesn't hold it as tenaciously as we might expect. So here's one example where Judy's System 1 reasoning seems to be at odds with her System 2 reasoning. When she pops into the DMV, her initial reaction to seeing the sloths behind the counter is, wait, they're all sloths? And she's clearly dismayed by this fact because she and Nick are in a hurry. Now, there's a sense in which this reaction seems completely reasonable when we see how slow the sloths actually are. But remember, Judy has this ideological worldview that she consciously endorses where you can transcend your species limitations. And if she really believes that sloths can't do that, then that's an inconsistency in her worldview. So here we have sort of her instinctive initial um, reaction, a reaction that's taking place under a lot of stress, which is going to be a context where your deliberation is hindered, she's engaged, she's having a reaction that seems to run counter to the worldview that she consciously endorses. The same thing is going on when Judy trails Nick into the ice cream parlor. When Nick first shows up in the movie, he almost gets hit by a truck. And that truck is coming out of an alleyway that crosses over a sidewalk. I looked up the law on this, and in those situations, pedestrians have right-of-way. So in other words, the truck driver should have been driving very slowly, and he should have stopped as soon as he got to where the, they meet the sidewalk and check for pedestrians. And it clearly didn't do that. Nick almost got hit. Judy pays absolutely no attention to the driver of the truck and focuses entirely on Nick and just sort of assumes that he must be engaging in suspicious behavior. Then she goes into the ice cream parlor and is kind of constantly suspecting that he must be up to no good. Now, she does actually wind up being right in that instance, but she didn't have sufficient evidence to believe any of those things. And her behavior her kind of just sort of initial reactions to what was going on reveal that she's not as unbiased as she wants to believe. Another way that Judy's System 1 and System 2 reasoning are at odds with one another 
is in her speech. This unflattering line of dialogue is an attempt at giving Nick a compliment that takes place right after she follows him into the ice cream parlor. She concludes that Nick's really just trying to show his kid a good time and, and that she was wrong to judge him in the way that she did and assume he was up to no good. So what she says is, I just want to say you're a great dad and a, a real articulate fella. Now, here's what's sad about this. Judy is trying really hard to give Nick a compliment. She's engaging in system two reasoning, and she's, that, that pause is indicative of an attempt in her mind to really come up with something good to say. But the best she can do is to describe him as articulate, which is not even really a compliment. If anything, this is a microaggression. This is an example of where she's trying to give, some, give him a compliment, but its implications, namely that foxes are not typically very articulate, is not flattering at all. The reason this happens is because Judy's System 1 associations with foxes are all negative. We can infer there were probably some negative things that she's been told by her parents, but her own personal experiences are also, I'm sure, a huge factor. What is she going to associate with Gideon Gray, the main fox with whom she interacted? He was a bully. He was mean. He was um, inconsiderate. He, he caused her physical injury. He wasn't very smart or very uh, well-spoken. Those are all negative things. Those are all negative associations. So when she's trying to give Nick a compliment, of course she's going to have trouble coming up with one. And that's why she winds up saying what she does. Another instance where her System 1 reasoning gets the better of her is in her press conference. This is where she says that there might be a biological basis for predators uh, going savage or being the only species that are capable of going savage. Think about the context of the press conference. Judy says specifically to Nick that she is really, really nervous and has never done it before. Nick says, you know, hey, press conference 101, answer their question with a question of your own and then answer that question, right? And when she first gets asked questions, that's what she does. And she seems to do okay with that strategy. Where she gets into trouble is when she kind of gets overwhelmed by the moment. So again, when you're really, really stressed out, nervous, that's going to impede your ability to engage in good System 2 deliberation. So if she had taken her time and carefully deliberated about what to say, she might have said something different. But what essentially happens is she throws out this thread about um, predators' biology, and the press picks up on that, asks some follow-up questions, and she winds up digging uh, herself a rather large rhetorical hole in what she says. It gets even worse after the press conference when Nick, who's not exactly happy about what she said, starts asking her about her views. And again, now, not only was she, was she just stressed out from the press conference, but now she's having this uncomfortable confrontation with him, and she says things like, Nick, you're not, you're not like that. You're, you're not that kind of predator. And, uh, and of course, that's not a very flattering thing to say either, right? The assumption is, look, look, Nick, you know, predators are terrible people, but you're all right. That's not a good thing to say. So... Unfortunately, Judy, again, despite having good intentions and despite wanting to give Nick a compliment in that context, in fact, does the exact opposite. Now, something important to recognize. Judy has a lot of moments in this movie where she recognizes, even if only briefly, her, her sort of latent biases. She just doesn't put it together until the end of the film. There's a moment at the very beginning where when she starts to think that her judgments about Nick are wrong, she utters, I'm such a, and reclasps the fox repellent you know, to her belt and looks down. That's what this is a screenshot of. 
that's a really telling little moment because it suggests, you know, she, she, she again, consciously, when she's given an opportunity to deliberate, she doesn't hold these views or these attitudes. And she recognizes this as like a, a lapse in her judgment, a, a mistake of some sort. Nick also points out to her in, in the DMV scene that her ideals and her reaction to the sloths are not consistent with one another. You know, he actually uses the language like, you know, I thought anyone could be anything. You know, just because they're sloths means they can't be fast. That's a problem, right? That's a problem for Judy's worldview. And this presumably is another instance where she's getting a little pressure put on the extent to which she really holds the ideals and values that she claims to hold. Now, the most important moment of recognition is after the press conference, because that's the one that spurs her on to, to self-reflect and to and engage in some kind of meaningful change in herself. Um, and here is sort of the iconic moment where she realizes that instinctively she has unclasped the fox repellent and is and is prepared to use it if, if Nick were to make a move at her. And that seems inconsistent with just staying to Nick. You know, I know you're not that kind of predator. I know you would never attack me. I know you're not, you know, savage, etc. But again, her system one instinctive reaction is short circuiting her system two deliberation. So now let's backtrack to that fox repellent scene. This scene has basically three phases. First, an observation. Judy notices the fox repellent on the nightstand. Then she deliberates and decides not to take it with her. But after leaving, she reopens the door and snatches it. Here's what's going on in that scene. Judy is engaging in system two reasoning by deliberating and deciding, uh, I don't need this repellent. What does the repellent represent? It represents her biases. So she's consciously saying, look, I don't have any biases. I'm, I regard all species as equals. I don't have stereotypical beliefs, etc., etc." But after she initially leaves, she has some kind of like gut feeling like, I just it can't hurt to take it, you know, that sort of thing. That's primarily an instinctive reaction. And we know it's an instinctive reaction because there's a nose twitch that precedes it. And in various instances in the film, her nose twitching indicates some kind of instinct that's kicking in. They actually allude to this very early in the film, and I admit I didn't catch this until several viewings in. They allude to this in the scene with Gideon Gray where his accomplice Travis makes a comment about how Judy must be scared of Gideon because her nose is twitching, right? Because her, her fight or flight response has, is kicked in, right? And that's, um, that's tied in some way to her nose twitch. So that's a giveaway. So in scenes where you see that nose twitch, you know something's going on with her instincts. The reason why this is such an important observation why the scene is so important is because this is essentially exactly how bias manifests in almost everybody now. Sure, there are some people who just have clear, explicit biases for various reasons. Uh, there are even people who live according to ideologies where those kinds of beliefs are built in. But for a lot of us who are in the viewing audience, the way that our biases work is much more subtle. When we have an opportunity to consciously deliberate, we will always endorse values of equality in some way or another. We will always recognize that other people should be treated as, e as equals to ourselves. And we will always reject racist, sexist, and other discriminatory um, ideological values. The problem is sometimes system one doesn't cooperate. Sometimes our instincts and our associations do not lend themselves to the, the, the views that we consciously want to endorse. And so even though when we deliberate, we decide not to take our biases with us, they come anyway because 
some of our system one associations are really strong and really, really hard to counter. And that's exactly what's going on in this scene. Judy wants to leave the fox repellent behind, but she just can't bring herself to do so. And unfortunately, a lot of us are in the same boat. When it... Now at long last, we're in position to finally understand why this little 15 second sequence that seems so insignificant is actually the most iconic scene in the film because it's the core of the film's message. It is a brilliant illustration of how bias manifests in most people. And as a recap, remember that the main problem is a conflict between Judy's System 1 responses, her instinctive impulses, and her associations, and her System 2 reasoning, which is her conscious deliberation. Now you might wonder, what relevance does this have for how we as individuals are to live? Well, obviously there are problems with acting on our System 1 impulses when they cause harm to others, and there are some examples in this film where Judy's actions definitely did that. But there's also a deeper problem than just that, than just the concern about karma causing harm to others. That's obviously significant. I don't want to downplay that. But there's a deeper problem with respect to our own moral character here. Now this is a screenshot of the, the badge that, that Nick gets at the very end of the film. If you look closely, you'll see that there are three virtues listed on the ZPD badge. Trust, bravery, and integrity. The problem for our moral character and the problem that Judy faces in the film is that this conflict between our System 1 reasoning and our System 2 reasoning threatens our integrity. If you look in that screenshot, right when Judy's walking out the door, the word integrity is the one that is in focus in the camera shot. Again, like just another brilliant little cinematic touch. Judy feels at this point in the film like she's lost her integrity because she realizes that while she wanted to come to Zootopia and protect the city and, and, and make, make it a better place, she feels like she's done the opposite, but she also feels like she has not exemplified the values that ZPD officers are supposed to have. She has fundamentally failed to live up to the values that she consciously endorses. Because that's really what integrity is at its core, right? It's, it's a willingness to stand up for what you really believe in, to not succumb to temptations to compromise your core values. But that seems to be exactly what's happened to her. She has compromised those values in various ways. Obviously, it wasn't intentional, which is why we feel bad for her in various ways and why we are still rooting for her at this point in the film. But it doesn't make the compromise of integrity any less morally significant. This is a central component of living a morally virtuous life, right? Living up to the moral values and ideals that you claim to hold and that you think are important. That's a central component of any morally virtuous life. This is why we condemn hypocrites so rigorously, right? People who do not practice what they preach. Here's what's interesting, though. When I surveyed my students in my class after they'd seen the film, basically everybody agreed Judy's biased in, in, in certain ways, even if she's unaware of it. But they also almost universally agreed that Judy was still a morally good person. So even though her integrity's been compromised, and even though she does have these biases, and even though those biases have led to some individuals being harmed, they still thought deep down she was a morally good person. The reason why is we typically don't regard people as being responsible for things they can't control. So the thought is Judy isn't really blameworthy for for having these biases. 
Now, if she recognizes her biases and then doesn't ever do anything to correct them, maybe she's blameworthy for that. But at least the presence of them seems to be something outside of her control, a result of her own experiences of the world and the way that her brain is hardwired. The good news here is the same thing can be said about most of us. Just because we have these biases doesn't mean that we have to hate ourselves or have to regard ourselves as being morally bad people. But it does mean we have to be vigilant about the ways in which our own System 1 reasoning can conflict with the moral values that we endorse when we engage in conscious deliberation. There remains one pivotal question lurking in the background of all this. How do we do better? How do we salvage our moral integrity despite the fact that our System 1 and System 2 thought processes can be working at cross purposes so often? The film basically gives us insight into two different ways, one of which is highlighted at the end by Judy's um, monologue at, at one of the police academy graduations. I'm just going to read that monologue in its entirety. When I was a kid, I thought Zootopia was this perfect place where everyone got along and anyone could be anything. Turns out, real life's a little bit more complicated than a slogan on a bumper sticker. Real life is messy. We all have limitations. We all make mistakes. Which means, hey, glass half full, we all have a lot in common. And the more we try to understand one another, the more exceptional each of us will be. But we have to try. So no matter what type of animal you are, from the biggest elephant to our first fox, I implore you, try. Try to make the world a better place. Look inside yourself and recognize that change starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with all of us. Now, if you're trying to situate that speech in a context of some kind of widespread solution to institutional racism and sexism, it's going to sound ridiculous and naive. But that's because it's not really meant to be about those things. This is another way in which those reviewers that we started out at the beginning who think this film's a racial allegory are going wrong. This message is clearly not meant to be some kind of quick, simplistic fix for all forms of systemic oppression. Those kinds of changes require, in addition to whatever individual or cultural change occurs in the background, political action and institutional reform. This film's not really about those things. It's not about political action or institutional reform. It's about individual moral character. So the advice Judy's giving here is about how we as individuals can improve. And the main thing that she is advocating is self-reflection. An awareness of one's own vulnerability to bias and a willingness to change. So one of the key ingredients here is to recognize that no matter who you are as an individual, no matter how morally perfect you think you might be, you are, just like Judy, vulnerable to bias in various ways. And it's not your fault, it's how your, brain's, it's how your brain works. And our brain's ability to make associations and to help us act on them has been crucial to our ability to interact with the world and to survive over, over many, many generations. But there are drawbacks, because sometimes the associations that our brain makes are not the best. They are either they are in various ways inaccurate and in some cases outright harmful to other people. So we have to be aware of our vulnerability to that. And of course, the other component is you've got to be willing to change your behavior in various ways. Once you become aware of these biases, you've got to be willing to try to do better. And the film also gives insight into one very important aspect of how, the, how this willingness to change could manifest into something tangible. You have to expose yourself to members of other groups. You have to expose yourself to people in these marginalized communities. You have to make an effort to interact with them seriously in, in your day-to-day -day lives because it's very difficult if you only interact, as Judy does, with a bunch of other 
prey animals and your only exposure or experiences with predatory animals are negative it's going to be very difficult for you to have a balanced perspective on predator species. The same problem can manifest for us in various ways when we only interact with certain groups of people and we entertain and don't seriously challenge stereotypes about other groups of people that we don't really know very well. So one way to counteract this get exposure to members of, of groups outside of our own in-group. Interact with them, take their ideas seriously, and try to improve. And this is, I think, a pretty good message for the film to conclude with, because the film spends so much time laying out the problem, laying out the way that bias manifests and perpetuates itself over time, and just how difficult it can be to dislodge. That it's nice that over the course of the film we get some evidence that it can be dislodged, that you can do better over time. Both Nick and Judy, through their own individual interactions with each other, come to revise their beliefs about the other, not just the other individual, but the other species. Right? Nick is very negative toward Judy when they first meet. He thinks she's naive, foolish, and will not make it in Zootopia. And Judy thinks Nick is conniving, selfish, untrustworthy, etc. And over the course of their interactions, they discover that, well, they were wrong not just about one another, but also in certain ways about how they have labeled other species. So it's great to see the movie wrap up on, on, on a hopeful note in what is, to be frank, actually a very grim narrative. I mean, when I brought this stuff to the attention of my students, a lot of them got kind of depressed because they, they, it made them feel like they were all terrible people in, in various ways um, because they, they, they struggled to live up to their own values. And that's not really the point. Um, you know, the, the, the point is not to make us depressed about our moral uh, fallibility. The point is to help us find ways to live better. And I think a big part of the movie's value is the way in which it helps us do that. Hope you've enjoyed this commentary. Send me an email at trevor.hedberg at gmail.com if you've got any feedback.